in isolation. Uh, this is no. <laughs> a question, no doubt, formed of a discussion with Professor Fales last evening and along very much the same lines, and it's for Professor Swinburne. Uh, suppose in the process of gathering up all these scripts and scraps and bits of things that people wrote on papyrus or the backs of pot shards or something, uh, suppose it turns out upon a major archaeological find uh, that these were not human inscriptions at all. They came into being by a completely random process devoid of human agency, whatever the ancient equivalent was of monkeys on typewriters. Uh, on your line that the, uh, the breath of, of God does not enter into the process of making scripture into scripture and canon into canon until later, uh, would you consider it to be at least a theoretical possibility? It's not something you really have to address. But would you consider the monkeys on typewriters hypothesis of the origin of every single character, every single Hebrew consonant and vowel, every other single letter of Aramaic and Greek uh, to have been the work of some entirely random, non-human process? Could be. It wouldn't affect my argument at all. Thank um, you. I was hoping uh, you'd say that. Because uh, it's, it's the people who put it together and used it that uh, it gave the meaning. Back here, Jonathan. Uh, yes, Professor Swinburne. Um, I'm wondering how the Bible can be the source of doctrine or a source of doctrine if, um, if you have to already understand doctrine in order to understand the Bible? Uh, yes, that's uh, an interesting question, and there's a long chapter in my second edition of my book on Revelation on that. There's a to and fro is the answer. Uh, that is to say, uh, at, at stage one, uh, there's an issue of whether, this comes up particularly with the New Testament, whether a book should be included or not. And there are various criteria for this, such as authorship, um, and uh, above all, whether it's uh, in line with already believed Christian doctrine. And uh, it then get, if it is, then it, it then gets in. Uh, but it then gets in uh, with a certain already prior understanding of Christian doctrine. Once it's in, then it's, help, it's being used for developing further doctrine. But this further doctrine can't, can't be incompatible with what you've already got. And so there's a, uh, a, this further doctrine may itself be used as a criterion for admitting further books and so on. There, there's a continuing to and fro process here. Uh, but, uh, the, the, what, but ultimately, uh, the motion starts from the church because the church determines which books get in. And its criteria, books only get in if they say certain things, but then uh, uh, it, it, uh, the earlier church's determination of which books get in helped to form the later church's determination of uh, how we should interpret these and it, to and fro. Yeah. There's, there were two, it's, we're going to this corner. There's a gentleman with the green striped shirt, glasses, Okay, and uh, Louise Anthony. Thanks. Um, Professor Swinburne, you uh, referred to something that other people have suggested as well, and that is that the, um, uh, that the Israelites were, were in some kind of, uh, in effect, in some kind of a school, and that uh, commands um, like kill all the Amalekites, slaughter every living thing, was a kind of lesson. I'm not clear what the lesson plan is. What, what was learned after they, after they did the attack? What, what told them something, and what was the something they were told by that? Um, uh, I argue God has the right to uh, command them to do this, and the issue is why he should uh, achieve this end by a, a divine command. And uh, I said that it was to bring home to them the importance of uh, true worship and true moral practices, including not being involved in child sacrifice. Now, of course, as one or two people have pointed out, in none of these respects were the commands entirely successful. 
but that is uh, a feature of human free will that uh, commands don't always work. But I should have thought it had, uh, in, if we take it for the moment as a historical event that they did exterminate the Amalekites, I should have thought that in that case it had quite a contribution to cementing their religion and saving them from a lot more spiritual pollution than they would otherwise have had. Um, they were, after all, a unique uh, community in the ancient world, uh, practicing this sort of committed monotheism. And it must have been very tempting indeed if you settled down, for the Israelites settling down among a community which, like the other communities in the ancient world, worshipped all sorts of other gods, for them to uh, uh, sort of worship a few other gods as well, just in case those other gods were more powerful. It must have been very difficult to keep intact the practices of, of the Israelite religion. And I should have thought that if this was a historical event, it helped uh, both to achieve that end by saving them from such pollution and also reinforcing in them uh, the importance of uh, true worship. But it may be, as it were, that the Deuteronomist uh, <coughs> or any other authors of the Old Testament uh, were giving a rather uh, hyped-up ac uh, account of what happened, and um, there wasn't nearly so much um, annihilation of the Amalekites as is suggested. We are, uh, we're overdue already, so if we can... <laughs> yeah. but, but in that case, at any rate, uh, the moral message of, of which I've described was implicit in, in, in that uh, passage. Let's thank our speakers.